culture of empathy is to dialogue about it and really, you know, create a dialogue. So this is all mm -hmm. part of creating that dialogue. And okay. um, I, I see that uh, the people, when people see all this material out on empathy, it's like hopefully they say, hey, there's something going on here. I, I better check this right. out. So that's right. a little bit of it. So well, let me just do a quick intro. So um, okay. hi, I'm Edwin Rutch, and this is Dialogues on How to Build a Culture of Empathy. And today I'm here with Indy Young. Uh, thanks uh, for <laughs> hey, <laughs> thanks for joining me, Indy. Yeah. No problem. I think I think this is the universal thing, right? On all the, videos. <laughs> it should be if it's not. <laughs> I liked it. It was a good, nice motion. So um, I want to you know, just start off by introducing you. Um, you know, I kind of checked your, you know, what you've done online, kind of put together a little, a uh, little bit of a bio here. That you're the founder of Adaptive Path, which is uh, mm -hmm. at adaptivepath.com. So it's a, I think it's like a human-centered design-based uh, company that's yeah. uh, here yeah. in the Bay Area. There were seven of us that founded it back in 2001. Oh, and. It sounds like you've maybe gone off on your own now. Yeah, more on your, yeah I, was, uh, I, uh, I think we came together, it was at the end of the dot-com era, the, the first <laughs> version of it. Um, I, I'm a software engineer by background and got into um, user interface design early in the 90s. Um, and I think everybody that we that we formed the company with was from a different background. There were people who were from journalism, people who were from um, more like the marketing end of things, people who were product managers. Um, everybody was involved in making something, though, and everybody had this passion to make it better or fix things or make things work a little bit better. Uh, so our passions all fell in together, and uh, we created that company to help other other organizations sort of bring this to the fore. Um, so this was the very, very beginnings of the user experience movement. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we're very much um, kind of still involved, at least Adaptive Path is still very involved in being kind of leaders, worldwide leaders. They run several conferences on uh, the management of user experience design within a large organization. They run a conference on service design, and they run a conference on um, user experience design itself, as well as a bunch of little workshops so, oh. and writings and stuff. So very much in the forefront of trying to get the information out there and just spread it around and help people. Um, and it's been really exciting to see how, uh, how much everybody around the world from all different walks of life have sort of agreed, I don't know with, uh, what I should say isn't necessarily agreed with, but gotten passionate about or said, hey, yeah, me too, mm -hmm. I'm passionate about that, um, and now you're giving me some words and some structure around it, and I can take it and actually make some changes in my organization, even if I'm way, way, way down in the organization's levels. Um, I have uh, the ability now to, to, to describe things in a more powerful way. Um, which makes a difference, and I think we're seeing a lot of that um, start to blossom right now. Mm -hmm. Is that the human-centered design work? Um, that that's yeah. kind of the the yeah. processes and the awareness and the consciousness of the process is kind of yeah. rising. Well, um, what especially was you know what uh, kind of brought you to attention to me is uh, I saw that you're working on a book. You know, it's a forthcoming book, Practical Empathy. Uh, it's, it said here, my book is about uh, empathy and generating better services and products for people you support via mental model diagrams. And then I saw another, you have an article interviewing for empathy, you know, empathizing with people's underlining motivations, open up, opens up different avenues for, for supporting their behavior. And then there's a whole bunch of talks you did all about mm -hmm. empathy, so sparking creativity through empathy, mental models, empathy, design, finding empathy through generative research, how to wield empathy. So I said, I got to talk to Indy. <laughs> this is my topic. <laughs> <Awesome>. but... <laughs> yeah. I bring it, I mean, I think empathy is such a broad topic that it applies to all walks of life, and I'm... I'm going to talk about just one little specific area of it, um, which is making a service or a product, making some sort of content, or making some sort of process better. 
Um, and that's something that a lot of people in organizations are interested in. Um, now, a process could be something that's very broad, like the process of um, getting voters to vote, right? Um, so so it, it comes into this little tiny area, but then it can also branch back out again. The, the, the process that doctors and nurses use when interacting with patients, um, that that's branching it back out again. So I think a lot of your other speakers have um, their little niches, and I just want to you know give them all that respect. I have no background in um, cognitive psychology or anything like that. Um, my, my work over the past 20 years has been specific in uh, making things better, making a product better, making a service better, making a process or some content better. And I, I want to emphasize that last one too. Uh, I think one of the big problems that we run into when we want to make things better is that we only want to make things better once. And so we end up making just one thing that's going to, supposed to work for everybody and not everybody's the same. And uh, people will look at it and come at it from different angles and make it work for them. Uh, sort of do that human thing that we all do where we sort of make do with uh, something that's out there uh, that isn't exactly what we need, but we, we're tool users, we can make it work, right? Um, and I think content is a big part of that. Um, you know, creating an app and then creating, you know, two or three different apps for the same purpose but based on different people's behaviors takes a lot of work. Um, and I think that's a barrier that is going to take a fair amount of convincing over the next decade to get people to go towards. Uh, but creating content with different tones of voice, with different backgrounds, and slightly different um, sort of behavioral models, lots easier. <laughs> uh, sure, it takes a lot of work, but you can replicate the you know the one thing that you want to write. Say you're writing um, a, an explanation of um, somebody's energy bill. Don't write it for just one person. Write it for a lot of different people who are coming from different walks of life. Uh, a good friend of mine is a technical writer for a statistics program, um, and she's taken this to heart. I mean, there's a lot of different types of people who use the program um, who are not just academic. They're out in the real world trying to get real world problems solved, and that requires a different approach and a different way of thinking. And if her work doesn't speak to those different kinds of approaches and angles, then she's not done her job. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, I think that... Um, the, the biggest problem in my little area where we're trying to fix things and make things better mm -hmm. is that when you bring up the word empathy, it means different things for different people. Uh, so a lot of people will think of it as a purely feeling-based thing. It's like, oh, you know, I, I could totally empathize with the user because I've felt that way before. Um, some people will think of it as, well, um, you know, here I am trying to board this plane, and all these slow people are in front of me, and clearly they haven't been on a plane in a long time, so I'm trying to, like, empathize with them, trying to calm myself down and, you know, and understand what it's like to be them. Uh, there's another way of thinking about empathy is, like, well, you know, how come they're not doing it the way that I expected them to do it? Is there a different way that they're thinking? What is their, their thought process and their reasoning process? Um, and, and I think this trips us up a lot when we try to talk to each other about empathy. Um, it's the you know quintessential describing the elephant and mm -hmm. the blind man, like, you know, large and flat, no, long and skinny, no, big and round. <laughs> it's it's all these different things, and, and it is all these different things. So my book about practical empathy is um, trying to say yes, it is all these things. Here are the words that we use to describe them. Um, here are uh, a few uh, handholds that you can use to sort of say, this is the kind of empathy I mean here, or this is the kind of empathy I mean there. And moreover, when you generate empathy or experience empathy, it's very different than applying it. And the book is going to talk about the difference between those two things and how you can apply it. I don't think we have a way of applying it in a repeatable, reliable way yet. We don't have the vocabulary to talk about it. We're, you know, we're all excited about it and all behind it, but what does it really mean and how does it actually come down? And each person has a different way of interpreting it, and applying it is very hit and miss. 
it's kind of like, oh, you know, I had that spark and it worked in that case, um, mm. but it didn't work in this other case. I was just talking to somebody who um, I've been asking people for examples of empathy being alive and well. When have you used empathy to help change something or make a decision at work? And one gal, um, yeah, I ask really broad questions like that so that each person can tell me what's top of mind. And one gal said, oh, it's all about working with this teammate of mine who's kind of difficult to work with. And I'm trying to understand what his emotions are. And in a meeting, um, uh, we were sort of trying to hash out what exactly each other meant. And I could tell that the rest of the people in that meeting room were going, oh, no, not this again. And so she's all like, I recognize that emotional uh, sort of feeling in the room. And so I decided, okay, I'm going to take this offline with this other person. And then when I'm offline with this other person, I'm going to try to make it a really comfortable space for him so that it doesn't feel to him like I'm attacking or anything, but I'm just trying to understand. Um, but it didn't work. He still felt like I was attacking. Mm. Um, and we didn't quite connect yet, and so I still have this problem and blah, blah, blah. So. Um, so it's, it's it's not something that people can apply really reliably necessarily. Mm -hmm. So you're oh, sorry. Yeah. And so I just what I was hearing there is that you're looking at kind of what do people mean a lot of things by empathy, and it's kind of like what do they mean? You're kind of doing an exploration of what people mean by it, and this was like one exploration was this person who was having mm -hmm. this experience, and like trying to find out what he meant by it. Well, you're having like difficulty mm -hmm. because he was like feeling attacked or judged or something mm -hmm. so it was hard to kind of find out what he was really meeting or yeah. feeling within the empathy experience. I think that was an example of the hit or missness. The hit or, oh, the hit or missness. Yeah. Oh. The, another example, this guy. Oh, it's not repeatable. Empathy is uh -huh. not, you can't like repeat it's, it. It's not like a, like a program where it kind of does right. the same thing every time. Right. Yeah. It's, a, it's really hard to get a repeatable uh, kind of uh, action out of it. Yeah. Mm. What I hope to do with the book is make it repeatable, at least for people who are doing what I'm doing. Um, so I was going to say this other example was uh, where this guy was writing software for nurses and was out in the field with a nurse watching how they were using the software to see how, uh, how they could change it or improve it and one of the patients flatlined. And he could see kind of her own remo emotional reaction and how the software just became a barrier to her getting done what she wanted to get done. Um, and it was really emotional for him because he'd never been in an experience like that. And I'm sure that nurses have ways of dealing with that. Um, but he couldn't, he couldn't, um, he had to go out, he said, and go out in the stairwell and sit there and like cry for a little bit wow. um, because he didn't know how to deal with it. And that meant that, he, I mean, clearly in the moment he couldn't talk to the nurse about it, but later he could maybe go back to talk to the nurse about it and understand what's going through her mind and how her reactions are. So, um, so that's how he was trying to grapple with the problem. Um, and I think that everybody, I mean, we know it's a, a empathy is, a very powerful thing that we can use, but how do we apply it? A application is really cloudy. Um, and I think one of the biggest problems that we face is that, at least in user experience design and user-centered design, uh, a lot of our methodologies are solution-based. It's all about solving the problem. We are so passionate about fixing things that we our mind just goes straight off into solution land. Um, and I think in that trip out to solution land, we do a lot of fast thinking in our own heads about, well, how would I fix this? And we apply our own perspective. Uh, I think that if we can bring empathy into the loop so that when we're doing that fast thinking, um, either we can channel someone else or we can slow down that fast thinking and take that trip a little tiny bit slower out to solution land. Um, so that we've got a chance to understand what's going through somebody's head, interpret what it really means, really understand it, because a lot of, um, a lot of work in this area 
has been very superficial. People are a little scared to get into the deep reasons, uh, guiding principles, uh, and you know what? Why are you thinking that? What what's behind that? How did it come to be? Tell me some other experiences that brought that up. Um, and people are a little reluctant, at least in my field, to get that deep. They just stay superficial. Oh, so you don't like that button? Okay, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and uh, it's because we have the solution focused then and we have uh -huh. this, oh, we need metrics and we need to be able to measure, you know, how it was before and how much better it is now. Um, so it's, it's uh, it, you're saying, if I just re reflect a little bit, what I'm yeah. hearing, kind of follow along, is that, uh, that within your field in human-centered design, people are, the, the kind of the culture there is like, let's solve the problem mm -hmm. and it's like, and so it's like kind of more of a quickness of let's quickly solve the problem. And you're saying that I was hearing kind of different uh, things. One is that you can't just design for one person. That you're wanting mm -hmm. to create design so that uh, that multiple people can use it, and so that it can be used by from multiple vantage points, different people. And then mm -hmm. so you kind of have to empathize with multiple people on how how they're using that, as well as Kind of the sense of depth, that the the quick uh, focus on on um, on the solution is not allowing the designers to go more deeply into the deeper underlying uh, values and uh, feelings and experiences, and that's what you're you're saying that you really need to spend the time to empathize deeply. Uh, before you kind of go for solutions. Yeah. And I think that's going to be a problem as well. Spend the time. That is, an, that's like a death knell to most people. Most product managers, most development teams, most entrepreneurs and startups like, oh, I don't have the time, sorry. We're going to do it based on my brilliant idea, right? And it's going to solve the problem for people who are just like me. But you know, there's a lot of people who aren't just like you, and they may or may not be the right audience for your, your, you know, idea out there. Um, so the, the, the thing I'm going to come up against is sort of this reluctance to spend time. So part of the book is going to talk about making this a practice, making understanding and listening something part of your everyday experience it's um, it's a mindset uh, you'll drop into it and you can teach yourself or train yourself how to drop into it so that you become more aware over the weeks the months the years of how to do this so the books um, got a section called the practice of listening and it's teaching people to you know when you're in line at the lunch counter when you're um, in the locker room, um, in any sort of space where there's people around you, grocery store checking out, you can chat with them and test this out, try it out. Um, it's it's a very, when you're listening, you're not ever saying anything. The idea is to really blank out your mind. So it's not a practice of, you know, knowing what to say. It's a very relaxing sort of thing. You don't have to think of anything. All you have to do is follow that person very closely. And every little step of the way, make sure you understand. Um, somebody said to me, um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't know anything about that person, so I looked him up. And automatically, I assume what I would do when I'm looking someone up. But I don't know what he would do when he's looking someone up. What does that mean to him? Why is he looking someone up? What's kind of behind that? Um, I don't want just how he does it. I want why he does it. What's the reasoning process? Uh, how does he start? When does he know when he's finished? Um, all of that sort of thing. And so as you're listening, the only thing that's in your mind is, wait a minute, do I really understand what he means? What he means, not what I understand. You know, I'm not filling in the gaps for him. I need to be aware of when I'm making an assumption. And that's also kind of a hard thing and also a practice. Um, so not only do I want people to strike up conversations uh, with strangers in these sort of familiar, safe environments, it's okay to talk to a stranger. I mean, you wouldn't want to do it in an elevator, right? That's uh -huh. <laughs> or on the subway. <laughs> That's forbidden. Um, but anyway, you, you strike up a conversation where you try to establish um, rapt attention 
so that the other person opens up and feels as if you're very interested um, and can sort of tell you a little bit of those underlying things. You need to establish that rapport um, and you need to learn how to do it. You have to practice. And the other half of the practice is recognizing your own emotional reactions and your own assumptions. Um, and I think this is something not a lot of us practice. I mean, emotional maturity is not a huge thing in the United States culture. <laughs> so um, I think a lot of this goes out the door, um, especially in business and science and things. It's like, oh, emotions, we don't need those, right? We're Vulcan. <laughs> Um, and even Vulcans, they're all like, no, no, emotions are a very important thing if you like try to study that. Um, but uh, but there's a, a time and a place for them, and it's just really important to recognize when you're having an emotional reaction. So part of your day, maybe you're you're walking down the street and you say hi to somebody and they grimace at you or something, and you're like, whoa, you know, what did I do wrong? What am I dressed funny? You know, do you not like me? Am I, you know, you sort of, oh, that's an emotional reaction I'm having. Oh, okay, wait a minute. Why did I, I had it because they gave me this nasty look. Why would they have given me this nasty look? Maybe their cat just died and they're feeling terrible. Um, you know, just make up a reason. It doesn't have to be true. <laughs> you know, they pass this person. But, but, but upon considering what that person was experiencing, you realize your own emotional reaction or your own assumption about what's going on um, is baseless, right? Or isn't necessarily the truth. You can imagine all sorts of different things going on, one of which, yeah, your reaction would have been the truth, but there's like eight other things that it would have been true for. Um, so the practice of, of, of recognizing assumptions and emotions and then also the practice of talking and, and getting people into a comfortable spot where you're just listening. Um, you're, you don't have to think of any questions. You're just saying, you know, things like, oh, so you hear somebody say, well, I decided to go to Belize this year for vacation. And you can say the word because, and they'll just keep telling the story. Um, and you can say why or what was that for? You, everyone, you know, tell me about that. that. Just you can do some of the reflecting that you were talking about to verify that you're understanding them right. Um, but you can also use reflecting as sort of like with ellipses at the end. Dot dot dot. You know, uh, you know, blue waters in Belize, right? Dot dot dot. <laughs> and that encourages them to explain a little bit more about what blue waters means to them and where that came from and what their guiding principle was um, behind that, if there was one. Um, so I, I can tell you tons of stories. Um, yeah, I, sure. Yeah, it, share it, some it, stories. Yeah, it's well that particular one. Um, the woman went to Belize because her friends go to Belize a lot, and um, decided this year they wanted to bring this couple along with them. They paid for their airfare, so it wasn't like Belize was a choice of theirs out of all the places to go in the world. It was a I'm going with friends. Um, yet we're friends for a certain reason. We met in a certain way. We met on a kayaking trip. There's water involved. We we always you know talk about kayaking and sea life and you know preserving the reefs and things like that. And so there's this sort of natural connection between people. And you get people talking about this was in the locker room, a, a listening session I was doing. Um, and I just learned so much about what was going through her mind and how she reasoned things out. Um, so my concept behind the book is that if people get this into a daily practice, listening, getting much deeper understanding, um, and also recognizing your own assumptions and your emotions, then when you're going off into uh, solution mode, when you're thinking of something, brainstorming a, a solution or fixing something, um, when you're you know, taking it full circle and implementing it and testing it, um, you can have these, this richer understanding of people in mind. Uh, one of the analogies I used is that um, empathy isn't going to tell you the solution, but it's feathering your nest and then you're creating ideas which are the eggs in the nest um, and it's supporting those eggs. and um, then the eggs hatch and they go out into the world and you see how well they do and then you can maybe fix it. Mm -hmm. right? Maybe that's where the analogy falls apart. But <laughs> anyway, the, the empathy itself 
it's those it's those feathers. It's that softness and richness that you have that makes the place where you come up with ideas that much stronger. Mm -hmm. So the uh, it's 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 I was kind of hearing this about the practice of empathy. So it becomes like a way of life and a way of being. So you're kind of mm -hmm. like always doing it in the conversation here with you and I. We try to be empathic with our other relationships and kind of on and every day going off, uh, standing in line or wherever. So yeah. really, it's kind of like cultivating this sense of uh, empathy. Uh, in, in everyday life and then even for this design thinking mm -hmm. is that uh, if you have that as a way of being and then empathizing with the people you're designing for you kind of create that cozy little nest that when the egg comes that you've got something that's kind of uh, holding that uh, yeah. they're holding their that's awareness true. and what's in, important to them yeah, I would say so, although the one thing that you said in the beginning um, I don't think is actually doable, and that is you can't be in listening mode all the time. Mm. Um, so right now when I'm speaking to you, I'm mostly in speaking mode, um, and I'm sort of referencing the way I organize all these ideas so that it makes some sort of sense <laughs> mm -hmm. as we're talking and then just like teeny tiny bits of like empathy to where you are with your world and understanding um, but mostly the practice is really something that I would do uh, when I'm not in a speaking mode so it's not something it, it's something that you drop into it's a it's a mindset or a frame of mind that you drop into every once in a while maybe you like meditation you're not meditating all the time um, but every once in a while you're like okay wow this is a chance I'm gonna meditate uh, my neighbor teaches meditation and she told me about how when she was in the airport years ago waiting for a flight she's like oh wow hey this is a chance I'm gonna meditate so drop into that frame of mind um, I'm in the airport uh, I see somebody next to me that has, you know, some sort of an interesting roller board, and I drop into listening mode, and I start asking them about their roller board or where they're going or whatever, and just sort of, you know, go along with it. But I'm in that mode at that moment, and then their phone rings. They answer it. I'm out of the mode. I'm going back into my, you know, I'm going to read my book or work on my slides or whatever. So I'm. And then she says, oh, you know, do you know where the bathrooms are? I'm like, I'm not in empathy mode at that point. I'm like, no, oh, go that way. And, um, you know, actually the lines can be really long that way. I'll bet you, you know, that kind of thing. It's, mm -hmm. that's not empathy mode. You're really only dropping into it occasionally. Um, and I think that's something that uh, the, the, those occasions can be frequent, but I don't think they're more frequent than once or twice a day. Mm -hmm. And uh, why would you want to do that? What's kind of the what's the reason for kind of going into that mode? Uh, well, reason number one is to practice. Um, uh -huh. The uh, reason number two is just curiosity. Uh, but reason number one to practice is so that when you do this formally. So another whole section of the book is to do this formally. If you're working at an organization. Uh, that you um, manage to convince that you need to incorporate a little bit more of this style of work into, you will set up formal listening sessions. You'll recruit a bunch of people who may or may not be potential uh, people that you would support with the process that you're making or with the content that you're developing or the product or whatever. Um, you pick a bunch of people and you sit down and listen to them about not not about the use of the thing that you're making but about the intent of what they're trying to get done what's behind it so I just finished a whole year's worth of work at a major commercial airline and we spoke we did like eight different intervals of formal studies um, and one of the intervals was to speak with people who were um, uh, sort of frequent business travelers and what does it mean uh, to set up a trip just simply the setting up of the trip and it was interesting because nobody started there they all started with the reason for the trip right my boss asked me I tried to get out of it I really think you know blah 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 or I wanted to stay at home with my four-year-old or 
you know, I'm I'm a sales rep, and um, I really, really support my clients and love to be in their uh, their little world. So I go on, you know, these circuits, right, and visit everybody and spend time with them and really get to know them. Um, or, oh gosh, you know, my boss was supposed to go to this executive meeting and he couldn't make it, so he's going to send me in his place. And I'm, you know, I'm not an executive yet, but that's what I hope to get, and this is a huge opportunity for me. So it all, it starts with sort of like this whole intent for the trip, not just the making of the trip. And then you get the intention of, you know, I need to fit so many cities into a certain period of time because my daughter's Christmas recital is on such and such a date and I want to be back in time for that. Um, or, gosh, um, if I'm going to Europe, say, from San Francisco, it's a huge time difference, I'm going to give myself a whole extra day to get used to the time zone change before I actually start my day of work. Right? So it's all this thinking that goes on behind it, tons of reasons. All of this is pretty obvious to us, mm -hmm. but none of this is addressed in any reservation systems yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? We, t we did a another interval where we're talking to the same people but about their day of travel. And what does it mean to, you know, try to get to the airport on time? How do you get to the airport? Where are you, you know, what's the transportation you use? How do you figure out where the gate is? Um, what are your habits around that? Uh, there were some people who um, would always have a certain time of day flight and liked to, these were frequent travelers, so they get to use the, um, and we did in experience, we did super high level. We did all sorts of different ones, but these guys were frequent travelers, so they had access to the lounge, and s several, like three different people told us, oh yeah, I always get there, you know, at least a half an hour early so that I can go to the lounge and get a cup of coffee and read a little bit of the paper. Um, so it's like, you know, well, why? Well, I don't want to be rushed. Whereas there's a whole other section of people who are saying, I get to the, the airport at the last minute because I've got so much to do at the office before I leave. And the connection better be on time. I'm only going to give myself, um, I mean, I need to get to the other office as soon as possible. So I'm giving myself a 30-minute connection. And sometimes I have to run um, if it's in the other wing of that airport. But I go through there a lot, and I know where you know, where the gates are and stuff. And, and so I organize it that way. So it's like all sorts of different approaches and things, um, none of which are really discreetly supported. Um, and so now they've got tons of feathers in their nest and they can start to brainstorm little solutions that will support people a little bit better on day of travel. Um, there was one group, not a commercial airline, they, they provide Wi-Fi and we were brainstorming just based on some, some lightweight stuff that we had done where one of the biggest things people were talking about was, hey, you know, I don't want to be in contact with the ground while I'm up in a plane. I, I kind of want to leave that all behind, even the news, you know, just, I want to leave that behind, but I do want to connect with the people on the plane. Um, so, you know, like maybe I'm flying to a conference, and I suspect maybe somebody else on the plane might be going to the same conference. It would be really interesting to find out from them which uh, talks they're going to go to and why. Um, maybe find out why they're going to the whole conference, what their experience is with it, if they've gone in the past. You know, just you know, general stuff that would be interesting to know. Um, or aside from the conferences, anybody else going to the same hotel that I'm going to? Can we share a cab ride? Because I'm a student and I don't have that much money and it's late and so I'm scared to use the transit by myself but I can't pay, for, you know, I can't really justify paying for a cab by myself. Gosh, it'd be great to have a buddy that, you know, I can sort of get to know on the plane or whatever. Um, or even the idea of, hey, we're all going into Denver and some of us have connections and, um, and it's sort of dinnerish time. Um, you know, wh wh does anybody know Denver Airport really well and know where the best chili w it would be, right? Could I get 
<laughs> a bowl of chili there, or you know, what what would be better if no bowls of chili are available? And so to sort of to capitalize, um, those were the ideas they were coming up with, to capitalize up upon the experience and knowledge of the people who are just on board, traveling mm -hmm. to the same exact spot that you're going to, whether it's just the airport or whether it's the city. Well, it sounds like the, one of the big motivations for you is to, uh, for support. You're really wanting to support people in what mm -hmm. they're doing. And that the empathy, I was kind of hearing that empathy is the way that you can uh, kind of support as many people as possible mm -hmm. or as effectively. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. I think that is actually my overriding intent. <laughs> and why do you want to support people, I guess would be the question. Why is supporting people uh, important to you? Uh, I love the phrase support people. Um, and it doesn't seem to be a phrase that people in my industry use a lot. They'll say things like, um, I have a killer app. Um, I have a great <laughs> idea. It's more, you know, <laughs> person focused and it's like, sort of the intent would be fame, maybe. Uh -huh. um, so, so some people fall into that bucket. A lot of people, though, fall into the bucket um, that I'm in, which is like, I want to make things better. Um, but instead of making things better from sort of like, I'm a genius designer point of view, I want to make things better from the point of view of really knowing that person that I'm trying to make life easier for. Um, so if you're in, you know, if you're a patient and you're going through something, you know, some certain sort of steps, um, how do I understand that and make it better for you? How do I understand that same set of steps for a different person and make it better for that person? Um, how do I examine that set of steps and make it better for the caregiver? Um, it, that sort of thing. There's a company uh, called HealthWise who creates all the content, all the online content for like WebMD. Or if you have a, a health insurance company where you can go online and sort of ask the nurse questions or look up stuff, um, they're the ones who create all that. They've been in business since the 70s. And they're all very much um, about sort of like the scientifically, uh, you know, proven way of doing things. So it's all very, uh, the stuff coming down from peer-reviewed journals. Um, and... One of the things that they decided to address, they, they wanted to get sort of beyond just that, the written content and get into the idea of helping people change their behavior. And one of the things they wanted to try to address was weight loss. Um, how many people have tried to address that, right? <laughs> um, to varying levels. Well, gosh, try addressing that without being in person um, even harder. And what they ended up doing was making... I think three or four different uh, packages based on the three or four different types of behaviors and philosophies that people were coming at it with. Um, so there was one sort of behavior and philosophy around um, like weight loss is something that's I keep trying and it's just, you know, whatever. It doesn't work for me. It's a vicious cycle. It's, you know, kind of whatever that thing is or my life is way, you know, it's just not working for me. Um, how do you write a package for somebody like that versus somebody who has an attitude is like, I did this before it worked, but, um, you know, I fell back into it and I need to lose some more weight. And um, in this time around, like, guess what? I'm working full time and I've got two kids in high school um, <laughs> and one of them's in orchestra and the other one's in volleyball and blah, 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 blah. Um, you know, how, that's a whole different approach, a whole different mm -hmm. attitude. You need different packages for those different things. And so um, the fact that they based their approach on the empathy that they developed, on all those feathers, all this, the work that they did listening to different wow. people, um, I think really makes a difference out the gate with what they're coming up with. I mean, out the gate, they came up with three or four different packages. I don't know how well they're doing, but at least they've got the right start. You know, the idea that mm, one package is not going to work for everybody and it's going to actually make some people angry. <laughs> um, so, so anyway, it, it's, I, it's n the whole idea of pausing to use the time to develop the empathy um, 
pausing to interpret and make sure you understand it before you go off, even before you go off into solution land, but even before you go off into analysis, right? People love, you know, I'm, I'm a researcher, I'm going to hear what you say and like jump to a conclusion about it and, you know, paint this overarching picture of you, uh, which may or may not be true. So you need to go through sort of this, um, this interpretive phase before you go to that. Um, and so what I'm trying to do is <laughs> make a case for the strength of the the, the product of that, um, and therefore more people will take the time to do it. Uh -huh. And to take that time iteratively in little tiny chunks, do it over and over again, keep adding feathers. The more feathers you have, the better. And uh -huh. it's not like the feathers disintegrate. <laughs> yeah. And so the feathers are really created by empathy, that each one is like a manifestation. Each one is like a manifestation of, of empathy, and the more uh, it sounds like it's kind of a cozy little place, a warm, cozy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you're if it's if it's uh, if if it's um, you know you're trying to make life better. It sounds like you're trying to create warm, cozy nests for people. Right. <laughs> 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 or whatever you know, if they're into like prickly, scary adventure. Then okay. <laughs> oh, then you'd make a prickly cactusy kind exactly. of a nest for them. Make exactly. nests for people yeah. the way that they want to have nests. Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but I really, you got to the... find out what it is that they're kind of needing uh, yeah. to begin with, and that's where the empathy comes in. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So you mentioned Obama earlier on, and one fellow that I was introduced to worked on the hmm, 2012 campaign, I think. I can't remember which campaign he worked on. But anyway, he said um, uh, over dinner, I was with uh, a friend of mine who introduced us, and um, he said one of the things that we did when we were going door to door was try to... Uh, it, apply empathy to the process of getting voters out. So instead of saying, we're coming up to your front door to convince you to vote for Obama, what they were having people do was, hey, we're coming up to your front door to convince you to vote and listen to the reasons of what you're interested in. We're collecting information. We're not trying to persuade. And there's a um, This American Life uh, episode that I have it in my book so I can look up reference numbers if you want but um, it was called Red State Blue State and one little tiny section of it was when two sisters um, were kind of upset with each other one was Republican one was Democratic and every time they got together they tried to persuade the other one to switch um, and they would say things you know not in front of them but each other but in front of the interviewer they would say things separately like she's a nice person how can she believe in blah 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 right mm -hmm. you know whatever and then both sides were saying it and the interviewer is a an author he wrote a book and I wish I could remember his name right now I could look it up but um, he said well I think the problem that you're encountering is that every time you talk you try to persuade mm -hmm. he said, what about just listening um, and the things that you believe about her being a nice person in your heart are going to be reflected in what she says, and you're still going to believe she's a nice person, and then you'll start to understand where she's coming from with her choices, if you listen, if you don't try to say anything. Um, and so I think it, toward the end of that episode, they tried it out. I'm not sure if it actually worked or not, but that was the premise. It's like, just listen. And the guy on the Obama um, campaign I'm like, oh, that, that, was, that was pretty cool. I don't care which president. I'm pretty neutral myself. I don't care which party you're interested in, but just the concept of not trying to persuade uh -huh. and instead trying to listen and just feather your nest so you can support people better, um, understand people better, listen to all sides, um, all different you know, approaches and things. Um, and I think that's going to help with the process that you're creating, that you're brainstorming based on, you know, in that nest based on those feathers. Mm. Yeah, I, I wonder why that, that creating that feathered nest and even wanting to support people, why that's even important to you. Yeah, you asked me that question before, and I'm like, I'm not sure I answered it right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, yeah, I'm not sure I um, have ever really thought deeply about why it's important to me. It just, I hate this phrase, it just is. <laughs> uh -huh. Did you grow up um, that way? Was it something your parents taught you? Or you know, did they say, oh, you know, be that <laughs> way or some experience of that? Or You know, it's probably not parental things, but... Um, probably more along the line of encountering situations myself where I didn't feel supported or understood. Mm. So, um, for example, this is a really humorous one that I just took a screenshot of this morning. Um, I work for myself, so I pay estimate taxes every quarter. And um, I use Mint uh, to keep track of things instead of Quicken. I used to use that, now I use Mint, whatever. It's just keeping track of things so that when you give everything... Um, and categorizing it uh, so when you uh, take care of your taxes you know what's what it's already done for you um, but this mint.com I guess <laughs> I guess it, so here's the funny anecdote is that to it just last what on the 16th or 17th was um, tax day Right, So I had put a bunch of money into my checking account so that the government could subtract it from my checking account so that it's an electronic fund payment or whatever and it all just goes smoothly and I don't have to worry about it not happening or forgetting. Um, and um, <laughs> Mint writes, your purchase at the IRS was, uh, you know, had gone through on Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> my purchase from the IRS. <laughs> I mean, I guess you could sort of think of it as me purchasing my governmental services. But it was just really cute. It's like, A, they didn't really think of this. Their solution didn't encompass this wider extent, right? Um, it's easy to fix. Um, it's really anecdotal and very small. But if they had... Uh, a small business owner in mind when they were developing Mint, it would have been different. Instead, they had a young person um, who is not super on top of their funds and their accounts in mind. Um, and I actually worked with them early on, so that's why I know that was what was in mind. Uh, granted, now the guy who did uh, the startup for it, Aaron Patzer, he did go out and listen to people. And what he did was he said, okay, you know, I can write 10 different applications for the 10 different kinds of people who need to manage their money, but I can't do that as a startup. I need to pick just one. And so he picked those young people who weren't quite on top of their accounts. And he said, this is a solution specifically for them. And did a great job, nailed it for them. Then Intuit bought it, and Intuit has not. I don't, I've worked with people at Intuit too, and they're brilliant there. But the powers that be haven't quite extended it yet. They don't have the small business owner's version of it like they have the small business version's, uh, owner's version of uh, QuickBooks. So, you know, we'll see. Things will keep happening. Um, I trust that more and more people are interested in feathering the nest. I trust that those feathers are being collected. People are teaching this all over the place. Um, and I hope that my book is going to help put vocabulary and framework around it so mm -hmm. that it is somewhat more repeatable. Mm -hmm. Well, I was hearing that the, kind of the reason you were wanting to support people is that you maybe didn't receive the support mm -hmm. yourself. So it's mm -hmm. like, oh, I know what it feels like not to receive uh, kind of that empathic support, so I want to contribute to others yeah. to have that kind of, yeah. it's kind of like a core, more of a core mm -hmm. value around more. empathy. Uh -huh. Yeah. Hmm. Well, is there kind of more around that? Um, uh, around the reason for supporting people? Yeah, you know, about empathy oh, and about empathy. kind of. Uh, yeah. There's a whole of, word. of the book about persuading people at large organizations to conduct empathy research hmm. um, because of these barriers. No one wants to take the time. Um, and no one really understands really what empathy is. People who um, kind of hold the budget are like, empathy is just a bunch of feelings, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not going to pay for you to go have feelings. 
Um, and so a whole section of my book includes a bunch of definitions and persuasive arguments around empathy, around qualitative versus quantitative and how they're not two ends of one spectrum, but two completely different spectrums that you need to have together. Um, I talk a lot about positivistic uh, sort of ways of thinking where it seems like um, the concept of science being um, the uh, the truth, right? Where there's only one truth out there and we're going to get at it via science has pervaded business as well. Wow. And you can't really think of humans in a positivistic way, or at least not human behavior. Maybe our biology, <laughs> mm -hmm. maybe our hormones, <laughs> maybe the way our brains work chemically, but, um, but the way we behave. Um, and so I, I talk a little bit about you know, being aware of how your organization might have a positivistic bent um, or an engineering sort of a bent to it and how to maybe introduce these, the concept of empathy into those different areas. Um, I think a lot of work needs to go in there um, because the people who generally embrace the idea of empathy are not not always the people with power. There are people uh, in a more high-level management positions who do embrace it, um, but I think right now there's still fewer. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's really about how to bring it in it's into a work environment, yeah. into a mm -hmm. corporation, into a company, into mm -hmm. any, I imagine, any kind of environment exactly. that there's a lot of people kind of blocks to the empathy being like, oh, that's just emotionalism, kind of dismissing mm -hmm. it, or kind of there's only one truth, so we just, we have the truth maybe, um, mm -hmm. and then... You need to be able to measure it, how you measure the feelings. Oh, what do you think about the measuring? Because that comes up all the time about uh, yeah. is the yeah, struggle it, of measuring empathy. I know someone's working on a PhD on measuring empathy, and he's in distress about it. <laughs> so, and then I just was talking with a, a, someone who's a doctor, you know, who's uh -huh. been doing work in Florida on empathy, and he says, I just gave up on measuring it. You can't measure it. <laughs> you know, he's trying to bring it into the medical oh, field. So. Yeah. Um, what did you come up with? Uh, and I have like a whole web page of just all kinds of measurements that have been up there and all these self-assessment ones. And uh -huh. then people like Carl Rogers say, um, you know, you, your self-assessment is just so off, you know, you, it doesn't work, you know. Mm -hmm. And he was even big shot uh -huh. uh, psychiatrists, psychologists, they yeah. think they're very empathic when they're evaluated by the patients and other people. It's like they're actually in negative empathy right. territory. Right. So, like, how do you go about measuring this, you know, right. this experience? Well, here's the approach I take. Um, there's two kinds of empathy. On the one hand, there is the emotional empathy. That's the reactive empathy that you have when you see somebody else having an emotion, and you may have a similar emotion or understand their emotion. On the other hand, there's cognitive empathy, which I'm going to call something different in the book mm -hmm. um, because cognitive in our field has all these other meanings. Mm -hmm. um, or like it's, it's such a buzzword that I don't want to go off in that direction. Um, so what I'm going to be calling it probably is intentional empathy. And that is to... Uh, to have the curiosity or the wonder about how somebody else's brain works. What's their reasoning process? How do they make decisions? What are their motivators? What are their guiding principles? What are their reactions? Both behavioral reactions and emotional reactions. And in terms of measuring empathy, I'm not so sure you can measure the emotional empathy part. Uh, might be hard. I don't know. I've never tried it. But on the side of the cognitive empathy, on the side of being able to understand what's going through other people's heads, you can start to measure that. I've never tried. <laughs> but it's definitely more quantifiable because, um, like with that example with a commercial airline client that I've been working with, um, the more that you can say about the different sets of behavior that people have. This, and, and the more people that you listen to and start seeing behaviors fall into those sets, those sets become 
pretty structurally sound. And they can become uh, what's known as personas in the field. Um, personas is something that Alan Cooper wrote about um, way back when uh, he started Cooper uh, Interactive. And Kim Goodwin has written a lot about it since then as well. Um, but personas has, have mostly been used in terms of solutions, comparing how well a, a solution works for a type of persona. Um, and what I'm doing is just a little bit before that. It's like, well, what are those groups and how can we get them solid? Uh, how much work, you know, how the, the quantifiableness is when those things feel solid enough that every additional person that you listen to falls into one of those behavioral mm. groups. Mm -hmm. So there's, um, oh, sorry, is there, was there more around that? It's no, a, right. It kind of kind of comes into, you're saying, like, what is empathy and kind of the definition, which is a bit of a morass in itself. Mm -hmm. um, kind of the framework that I've used is uh, kind of four major, I call it the wheel of empathy. So mm -hmm. there's uh, self-empathy, so that's that awareness of what's going on, the sensory awareness of what's going on inside of ourselves. What are the feelings? as they move and evolve, yeah. and that kind of attunement to that. Then there's the uh, mirrored empathy, which is kind of based on, mm -hmm. uh, I think, uh, mirror neurons. Right. So as I'm waving my hand, you know, your neurons are firing as if you're waving. Mm -hmm. And then there's like, and that's like for the you know, academics like to call it, you know, mm -hmm. emotional or affective empathy. Mm -hmm. I like the, like you, according to my own terms, mirrored empathy. <laughs> which right. I think is a little more of a feathery kind of a term. And then <laughs> there's the extended empathy beyond that is, um, you know, what I think you're calling, that the, the academics are calling perspective taking or uh, perspective taking mm -hmm. or cognitive empathy, mm -hmm. and you're calling it, what was the word you had again? The, for intentional, intentional empathy. empathy. And yeah. I've heard some people call it an it's an extended empathy you know besides this basic empathy and I like the term uh, imaginative empathy because you're kind of like imagining using your imagination mm -hmm. to tap into that into those feelings mm -hmm. and then there's the um, uh, the third part is fourth part is empathic creativity or empathic action which is that part that when we connect and we feel into the other person, we're kind of like holding their the awareness mm -hmm. uh, of them. You know that they're they're kind of their beingness. We kind of uh, empathize with that and are feeling it. That we hold that in our actions, and we kind of want to contribute to people's. You know, we want to mm -hmm. contribute to their well-being. Is almost seems to be a, uh, you know, that's, when people. Yeah, that's the feathers in the nest. That's the feathers in the nest. Yeah, Let yeah. me mm -hmm. help feather your nest. And yeah. let's mutually feather our nests here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so that's kind of the, the framework. So yeah. uh, I've seen in, in your work that uh, with human-centered design that, you know, you're looking to see, well, what are people needing, right? So you're going out mm -hmm. there and you're, you're hearing, you're listening, you're using that listening. And then, um, then that extended uh, kind of empathy or, or that modeling, I think that's what you've done a lot with, right, is those uh, mental models, I mean, very extensive. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. to the nth degree, kind of like mental models of people that have all mm -hmm. kinds of different relationships. So that's the part that you're saying that you can kind of measure, you can create those mental models and mm -hmm. that uh, you can see are, when you're bringing in more people into that model, is the model mm -hmm. shifting? And if it's oh, not really right. shifting anymore, that at mm -hmm. that point, yeah, I think we've kind of gotten empathy because mm -hmm. it's incorporating all the new uh, mm -hmm. empathy, empathy. So it's kind of create. It's actually kind of like a self-empathy model in the sense that you're you're feeling what the the space of everyone is, and you've kind of created a model for that. And mm -hmm. yeah, so. well, there's two levels to the model, and I think with that self-empathy reference, the the model itself um, it becomes more stable over time. And oh, how do I want to say this? Um, so the model itself represents sort of behaviors and reactions and guiding principles. Um, and it also can be, uh, can show the different behavioral groups and how they work. So maybe one behavioral group um, does a lot of 
stuff in one part of the mental model, but not all parts of the mental model. Um, so, or you know, they they intermingle in different different ways. Like if you assigned colors to the different behavioral groups, and you had um, red, green, and blue, maybe there's a whole area that's like red and green, and then another one that's blue and red, and and maybe over here it's green and blue or something. And so you see them intermingling and stuff. Um, so there's those two levels of it. And the other thing I wanted to say is that with that idea of sort of self-empathy is that the definition that I use of mental models, um, so Don Norman wrote a, uh, a book called The Design of Everyday Things way back when. Um, he used to work with Apple. He's considered one of the pioneers of user experience. And um, his definition of a mental model is a model that uh, a person has of a thing, a process, uh, other people, or an environment. And for me, I cross out, it's not a person's model, it's your team's model. Mm -hmm. It's the model that you've all created together so that you're, you're feathering that same nest together and you're all feeling that downy fuzziness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so it's the model that your team has of others. It's not a model of a process. It's not a model of an object and how an object works. It's a model of the other people that you're trying to support. Um, and so, that, so it's a shared model of the mm -hmm. team, that the team has a shared model that they're operating from to mm -hmm. support other people. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm. So then you've got, you've also got, it, it makes a nice place to sort of use as a repository of all of this, because you, you know, empathy is all about words, it's all about linguistics. Um, there have been re models done in all sorts of different languages. Um, no matter what language you're using, what you're trying to do is represent understanding. Um, and so it's all it's all very based on linguistics. And um, the idea of trying to get your head around all of those different understandings is just kind of like blah. <laughs> You, know, you, you can go through story by story anecdotally, but that gets really long and hard to get to and really hard to zero in on because we're using these things iteratively every month, every six months, every you know year, whatever. We go in and we're zeroing in on something and going, okay, now this. Now let's support this better. Um, and to zero in on something when you just have a whole bunch of anecdotal stories is kind of difficult. So I, I put them into this model structure so that they're easier to notice. Um, easier to find, easier to relate one to the other, um, and also easier to like sort of check off. Hey, we supported this really well. Here's how we support it. Um, or, hey, this is the area where we're, our support is just sort of half-assed and we need to fix it, right? <laughs> um, so we'll circle that one. Um, or, hey, here's an area where we don't do any support at all, but that's fine because that's not the mission statement of what we're trying to get done. Um, I work with a lot of uh, organizations that are very small or don't have a lot of money, government, um, uh, libraries, things like that, um, but that still have the passion for this. And, um, and since it's iterative and since you can just you know, do a couple of listening sessions and pull something together and then add to it over and over and keep adding to it over the years, it works beautifully, um, and it's nice if you've got that structure. It's nice to be able to see where to add in, where these things are related. Well, I've just uh, you know I've done some interviews with people around uh, um, you know human centered design a while ago, and I've you know been tracking it, but only in the last three or four months have I really started looking into it, getting all the manuals, really studying it, uh -huh. and, and mm -hmm. so while I've you know talked to people about it. And you know, I went to Stanford, did the you know the gift giving thing, get experience and all that, and it really resonates with me. I said, "Wow, why did I get into this more?" Because it really creates a an easy to use structure that at least is is Stanford. You know, is there articulating it that empathy is like this explicit part of it? Mm -hmm. You know, that empathy is like mm -hmm. the first part, and it seems like you can actually. Um, that empathy, you could see human centered design as an empathic conversation at its mm -hmm. core, or an empathic dialogue, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that you're designing for people, you're seeing how it works and lands for them, empathizing with them some more. And uh, 
you know, and so that's what's really excited me because I'm looking at how do we really transform society and make society, uh, a fa you know, to have empathy as a foundational value, which I just see all the problems that can, you know, I mean, it can make kind of a big feathered nest, you know, all over the world, kind of, <laughs> really. So uh, that's really what I'm looking at now, too. That's mm -hmm. why I'm wanting to interview more people around human-centered design and all the insights that the community has to see mm -hmm. how I can kind of use it, too, um, and, you know, use it towards kind of movement building uh, in terms mm -hmm. of building an mm -hmm. empathic movement. So how might we create a culture of empathy or how might we create a family culture of empathy or, you know, any kind of a, you know, area scope or whatever you want to call it that, you know, to kind of focus in on. So just a little bit about kind of how my interest in, mm -hmm. in this. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So, well, um, we've gone over an hour, so I don't know how your schedule is. I don't want to keep you uh, over <laughs> your time, your other appointments and whatnot. Do you know how passionate we are about this? <laughs> oh, I can talk for hours, I mean, especially, I, it's, it's, you're very, it's very insightful. I mean, you've really been digging into this, so mm -hmm. I think it's really helpful to, you know, here, when is your yeah. book coming out? What is the... Hopefully it comes out in the spring. Okay. Um, from a publisher called Rosenfeld Media, who is a new publisher, um, probably about five or six years old, specializing in user experience books. Um, so it's really aimed at that audience, uh, but I would like to see it sort of, you know, it blossom out of that and get into more of the hands of, of people making business decisions. Um, or the hands of people who are at the heads of different organizations, whether they're nonprofit or governmental or educational or whatever, um, and in the hands of you know people who are in situations where they could practice listening um, and make it more a part of their lives. So um, hopefully, <laughs> I'm not sure that the publisher that I'm going with is going to get us there, but we'll see. I think it would be great because I think it has huge potential, especially using human-centered design to foster more empathy in and of itself. I mean, sometimes it just can be used to create superficial kind of uh, products, you know, mm -hmm. maybe mm -hmm. stuff. But it seems mm -hmm. it also can be used to address really deep core foundational values. I mean, I just see the potential. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah, there's definitely the potential there, and I guess... What you and I are both doing is getting the word out, um, and I'm reassured that you came up with the structure that you described, and it has exact parallels in the structure yeah. that I've come up with. So it's kind of like, oh wow, okay, great. You know, in another ten or twenty years, we'll have this this vocabulary and structure around it, and it won't be so much of an issue as it is right now when we try to talk to one another about it. Um, and yeah, whole and other quotes, right? Yeah, try have the ahead. vocabulary. Yeah. yeah. It's well the mm -hmm. other I kind of a whole different kind of an aspect I'm really curious about is your needs. I've been starting to ask people, what are your needs for empathy? To really hear what people's needs are. And I'm kind of curious like what your core need would be for empathy. My core need is um, as in so the consulting that I do is really to help uh, teams get started with this sort of thing. Um, and so the core need that I have is to demonstrate to them how depth of understanding really can affect the way they brainstorm. Mm. Um, mm. It, mm -hmm. it really, it, it, it does have an effect. Um, and I guess the other need I have <laughs> is more examples of how this has become a success by other definitions than just our design definitions. Um, other definitions such as business definitions or such as um, productivity or efficiency definitions um, or, or all those things that um, that the people who give the okay to put the budget in this are concerned with. Um, so I, I don't know that there's enough. Well, there's some of those examples out there, and they're going to have to be enough for now. I would certainly like to see more. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, so kind of the benefits. How is this really benefiting yeah. people? Yeah. That's I just started a project on that benefits of empathy. So if you, oh. I would, I would, you know, just to really systematically go through all the benefits. I'm gathering all the benefits, starting to talk to people. What do you see as the benefits? So that it's not like the. I think you had the, the term of, you know, telling people to do something. I can't remember what the word was. Tell them to do it instead of telling them to do it. It's like say, "Hey, here's all the benefits, and here's examples of the benefits." Right. Yeah, there's a persuasion side. Persuasion. Of it. That's it. Yeah. That's the word you use. Don't try to persuade people because right. that just puts people off. Say, "Hey, look right. at all these wonderful benefits yeah. that, that it has." Yeah. Exactly. So, well, this is like great. Um, if you're ever wanting to just like chat more about it, sometimes just you know, kind of okay. having someone to kind of kick ideas off of mm -hmm. and kind of explore topics, I find very helpful just to be. Just to be yeah. heard in itself yeah. is kind of like a very helpful process. You're, somebody else is hearing you and maybe gathering insights, but I find yeah. it very um, emotionally uh, uh, beneficial as well. It kind of it has just, a nice feel to it. I just spent three weeks running around talking to all sorts of different people and trying to make new connections and asking them how, you know, how they think about this especially in terms of um, different audiences that I'd like to reach, like software developers, um, to make sure that you know my message is going to be on target um, and not too overdone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? So yeah, it is. It's really beneficial to go out and just listen to what a lot of different people have to say about it and where they're coming from. Um, it either validates things or it gives you bigger epiphanies about how to, how to put things together in your in different words that will be more graspable. Mm -hmm. So using human-centered design yeah. to create your book, in a sense. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you can't not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thanks so much uh, for spending the time, yeah. Indy. It was a lot of fun. Really enjoyed uh, yeah. that, this point of view. I really enjoyed it a lot. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you, Edwin. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, with that, I'll say...